Hi. Today we're going to talk about families. In particular, we will discuss the inheritance of traits. Pedigree analysis has been key in our understanding of the genetic basis of disease. Enjoy the lecture and remember to prepare a question for question time. Now here comes a voiceover. Welcome to the lecture. Pedigrees are very useful tools that can help us determine the mode of trait inheritance and whether a trait is sex-linked, dominant, or recessive. Pedigrees are particularly useful because the study of, of human genetic characteristics can be difficult. There are a lot of obstacles. Controlled matings are not possible. Humans are not a model organism that you can manipulate in the lab. The generation time, the time it takes for a human to become fertile and reproduce is quite long. Family size is small, so how do we get around this? There are certain study methods that work well. Pedigree analysis, which we will talk today, about today. Twin studies, which we'll also go into today. Adoption studies, which are useful tools that allow us to look at environmental effects. And there's also genome-wide association studies. These are studies that examine many common genetic variants in different individuals to see if any variant is associated with a trait. We're not going to talk about that too much today, but I hope to get more into this topic in a later lecture. So here's a pedigree. The generations are on the left. You can see uh, a number of markings on this. For example, males are marked by boxes and females are marked by circles. A person affected by a trait is usually marked in red. So let's go through the symbology here step by step. So unaffected ind individuals are not shaded. You have the male with a box, a square, female with a circle, and the sex unknown or unspecified is denoted by a diamond shape. All individuals that are affected are usually colored. Obligate carriers, someone who carries the gene but does not have the trait, are marked by having a red circle or a colored circle in the center. An asymptomatic carrier, someone who's unaffected at this time but may later exhibit a trait, has a line through the symbol. And multiple individuals can be marked by putting a number inside the symbol. A deceased individual in a pedigree is marked with a slash like this. The proband, which is the first affected family member that comes to the attention of the researcher, is marked with this arrow and the letter P. For individuals in a pedigree that are unknown, a question mark is used. So this is an example of a family. Parents, male and female, that have three children, one boy and two girls. And they're usually written in birth order. And the lines that are shown here connect them as a family. In cases of adoption, you have brackets around the adopt adopted individual. And the dashed line denotes the adoptive parents. Solid lines denote biological parents. For twins, you have this special symbol. For identical twins, you have a line in between the, the connecting lines here. If they're non-identical, it's just two, two lines like that. And if it is unknown whether the twins were identical or non-identical, there's a question mark. Consanguinity, which is mating between related individuals, is indicated by two lines. So you can see here that two cro closely related people uh, married each other. In this case, two siblings. This is a typical pedigree for an autosomal recessive trait. A pedigree with a, of a recessive trait has these characteristics. If neither parent has a characteristic phenotype, let's say a disease, but the disease is displayed by the child, the trait is likely to be recessive. 
the trait will also be autosomal if the gene is on one of the autosomes. Since it's autosomal, male and, and female offspring equally are equally likely to inherit the trait. Traits tend to skip generations in these types of pedigrees. And of course, when both parents are heterozygous, approximately a quarter of the offspring will be affected. And the trait appears much more frequently among the children of consanguine marriages. The effect of this consanguine marriage is shown in the fourth generation where you get an affected male child. Autosomal dominant traits are a little bit different. In this case, affected individuals can appear in every generation. This is an example of Vardenberg syndrome. It is also autosomal because the gene is on one of the chromosomes that is not the sex chromosomes, chromosomes 1 through 22. Male and female offspring are equally likely to inherit the trait. A trait that appears in successive generations is normally due to a dominant allele. So as we see here with this pedigree, there are many affected individuals, much more than in the autosomal recessive pedigrees that we saw before. Offspring that are affected must have an affected parent unless they possess a new mutation. A new mutation would be a rare occurrence, but it is possible. This is what an X-linked recessive trait looks like on a pedigree. You have an unaffected female carrier in the first generation. And then you can see over time that males are affected, whereas females are just carriers. So as I said, it is X-linked. So therefore, the trait is preferentially seen in males who are hemizygous, since they only have one X chromo chromosome. And the females in these pedigrees can be heterozygous carriers. Most X-linked traits are recessive. For a mother who is a heterozygous carrier, approximately half of her sons will be affected. These traits are never passed from father to son. All daughters of affected fathers are carriers. Affected sons are born to unaffected mothers. One example of this would be the inheritance of red-green color blindness, which we've discussed before. For X-linked dominant traits, both males and females are affected, often more females than males. This does not skip generations. Affected fathers will pass the trait to all of their daughters. Affected sons are born to affected mothers. Affected daughters must have at least one affected parent. Affected mothers, if heterozygous, will pass the trait to half of their sons and half of their daughters. Dominant mutations are also seen on the Y chromosome. In this case, only males are affected, and the trait is passed from father to all sons. And this does not skip generations. Twin studies have been very useful in genetics. Monozygotic or identical twins, these share a single egg with single sperm and the embryo then divides into two. So you get two genetically identical people. There's a constant rate of this, about four pairs per 1,000 births. Identical twins or monozygotic twins does not run in families. They are born at the same rate across all families. Dizygotic or non-identical twins are the product of two eggs fertilized by two different sperms. They just share the womb together and develop together. They have half of their genes in common, just like any other pair of siblings. Having Non-identical twins does tend to run in families. So if you're in your family, there are a lot of dizygotic or non-identical twins, there may be a genetic basis to this. Now these studies are very useful because you can test the effects of having identical genes. To understand twin studies, we need to look at concordance. And what do I mean by concordance? 
Its origin is Latin from concordia, which means agreeing or harmony. And concordance is agreement in the type of data that occurs in natural pairs. And the pairs we're interested in are twins. So a set of twins or concordant, if both are affected or both are unaffected. They are discordant if only one of them is affected. Obviously pairs that are non-identical twins or siblings or husband and wife may be more discordant because they do not share the same level of genetic similarity. If a trait is really genetic, then monozygotic twins should share high concordance for that trait. So let's look at some concordance information that is out there. Now these are studies done with both monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic being identical, dizygotic being non-identical twins. For heart attack, you see that there's a higher rate of concordance among monozygotic twins than, than dizygotic. This is also true for heart attack and females. In fact, even more so. Bronchial asthma has increased concordance among identical twins. However, cancer is not really very different between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Epilepsy has a high concordance in monozygotic twins, so it is more likely to have a genetic basis. Death from acute infection does not have a high level of concordance, and this level is not different between the monozygotic and dizygotic twins, therefore there's not likely to be a lot of alleles that determine a genetic difference in the response to acute infection. Now, perhaps we will find a family that has such an allele, but that has not been found. Rheumatoid arthritis seems like it may have a genetic basis, as does multiple sclerosis. So I hope you can see here that comparing monozygotic and dizygotic twins allow us to make predictions about what type of illnesses are, are more likely to have a genetic basis. So looking at all this data together, you can see that some traits seem to have a strong genetic basis, where other traits do not really have a very strong genetic basis. And you can determine this by comparing the monozygotic and dizygotic twins and their rates of concordance. So for example, if we look at obesity, here you can see a chunky mouse and a very lean mouse. In humans, monozygotic twins had a higher concordance of their body mass index. Therefore, body weight appears to be influenced by genetic factors. A person only inherits a genetic predisposition for obesity, since obesity is due to caloric intake exceeding energy expenditure. So basically, eating more than you burn. And a gene for obesity has been cloned, and it codes for the leptin protein. And this is produced by fat tissues, and it works to decrease appetite. There are many people working on leptin, and it is, may become a useful tool to somehow design new ways to regulate appetite and reduce obesity. Adoption studies are very important because they highlight the influence of the environment on a trait. Adopted siblings share a common environment with their adopted parents, but they are not genetically related to them. So the similarities in traits indicate environmental influences. Studies of these sorts that I've described have been very useful in covering genes that affect human health. And two of these genes have been really important in breast cancer. We have the BRCA1 gene and the BRCA2 gene. The BRCA1 gene has been mapped to chromosome 13, and the BRCA2 gene has been mapped to chromosome 17. These genes give people a predisposition to have breast cancer. Pre-symptomatic genetic testing involves 
testing if healthy people in a family carry a gene and to see if they are at risk of a particular illness. Testing is particularly useful for autosomal dominant genes such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. Just a little bit about these particular genes. They are important in DNA repair, cell cycle arrest, and cell death. These are all important cellular processes that protect cells from becoming cancerous. These genes are important regulators of genome stability and work to prevent cancer. So when you lose these genes, you're more likely to get breast cancer or other forms of cancer. Now, genetic testing and other forms of testing are not just about whether you're going to get cancer or not, you also may come to a time in your life when you're worrying about the health of a developing fetus and want to make sure that the baby that you have is healthy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this topic because I think it's something that is going to be very useful to some of you. Here we have an ultrasound. Ultrasonography has been very useful in tracking whether a baby is developing properly in utero. It allows a direct visualization of a fetus and it can be used to detect spinal, skull, and skeletal abnormalities. Amniocentesis is a more invasive way of understanding the health of the baby. It involves taking amniotic fluid, isolating fetal cells, and doing chemical and DNA and chromosomal analysis of these cells to determine if the baby is healthy. So this is a very common way of testing fetal tissues. It is an invasive procedure because it involves taking amniotic fluid from a pregnant woman. It's done usually in the 16th week of pregnancy, but it can be done earlier, particularly if you're concerned about a particular illness that may run in your family or if there's uh, issues that come up with the ultrasound and, and the baby has some, some defects potentially. The cells that are obtained are cultured to amplify them so it's easier to analyze the cells for um, the different chemical and genomic tests that are done. One of the problems though with this technique is that it can result in miscarriages. And it also takes some time between when you actually get the amniocentesis done and then when you actually know what the issues are. The chorionic vil villus can also be sampled. This is called CVS. So it takes cells of the chorion and does a similar type of analysis on them to look at um, different chemicals that these cells possess, which is useful for looking at certain diseases, such as Tay-Sachs disease. You can analyze the DNA and, of course, do chromosomal spreads and look at the karyotype of the baby, just like an amniocentesis. It's done during the 10th and 11th week of pregnancy. It's a direct sampling of the outer layer of the placenta, and you have to be careful if you perform it too early, you can get limb defects. Medical practice is increasingly becoming more genomic in nature. And we're beginning to move on from some of these invasive techniques. One of the latest techniques is the cell-free DNA testing. I think one of the most fascinating things about this is that DNA from the placenta represents the DNA of the fetus and maternal DNA are both in blood plasma. So what you can do is isolate this DNA, the DNA coming from the placenta, and you can do a genomic analysis of this, and I'm gonna describe this now. So as I said, fetal DNA circulates in a woman's bloodstream. This DNA is isolated from a pregnant woman's blood without any invasive techniques such as amniocentesis. You get this DNA, it's from the plasma. So you don't even really have to lyse cells, you don't need fetal cells, nothing like that. Fetal DNA is sequenced using the Illumina platform to detect chromosomal abnormalities. And now I'm gonna explain how this Illumina sequencing works. 
This is a very, very important technique that has not only changed biology, but is likely to change medicine. And it will allow you to someday get your own personal genome done, probably the genome of your baby. And if we work hard as geneticists and try to understand what all this information means, we may be able to prevent a lot of disease. So enjoy the video from Illumina. This is not a product endorsement, but I must say I've used Illumina a lot in my career and it is a really great next generation sequencing platform. Sample preparation begins with extracted and purified DNA. The first step in Nextera sample preparation is tagmentation. During tagmentation, transposomes simultaneously fragment and tag the input DNA with adapters. Once the adapters have been ligated, reduce cycle amplification adds additional motifs, such as the sequencing primer binding sites, indices, and regions that are complementary to the flow cell oligos. Clustering is a process wherein each fragment molecule is isothermally amplified. The flow cell is a glass slide with lanes. Each lane is a channel coated with a lawn composed of two types of oligos. Hybridization is enabled by the first of the two types of oligos on the surface. This oligo is complementary to the adapter region on one of the fragment strands. A polymerase creates a complement of the hybridized fragment. The double-stranded molecule is denatured and the original template is washed away. The strands are clonally amplified through bridge amplification. In this process, the strand folds over and the adapter region hybridizes to the second type of oligo on the flow cell. Polymerases generate the complementary strand, forming a double-stranded bridge. This bridge is denatured, resulting in two single-stranded copies of the molecule that are tethered to the flow cell. The process is then repeated over and over and occurs simultaneously for millions of clusters, resulting in clonal amplification of all the fragments. After bridge amplification, the reverse strands are cleaved and washed off, leaving only the forward strands. The three prime ends are blocked to prevent unwanted priming. Sequencing begins with the extension of the first sequencing primer to produce the first read. With each cycle, four fluorescently tagged nucleotides compete for addition to the growing chain. Only one is incorporated based on the sequence of the template. After the addition of each nucleotide, the clusters are excited by a light source and a characteristic fluorescent signal is emitted. This proprietary process is called sequencing by synthesis. The number of cycles determines the length of the read. The emission wavelength, along with the signal intensity, determine the base call. For a given cluster, all identical strands are read simultaneously. Hundreds of millions of clusters are sequenced in a massively parallel process. This image represents a small fraction of the flow cell. After the completion of the first read, the read product is washed away. In this step, the index 1 read primer is introduced and hybridized to the template. The read is generated similar to the first read. After completion of the index read, the read product is washed off and the three prime end of the template is deprotected. The template now folds over and binds the second oligo on the flow cell. Index 2 is read in the same manner as index 1. Index 2 read product is washed off at the completion of this step. Polymerases extend the second flow cell oligo, forming a double-stranded bridge. This double-stranded DNA is then linearized and the three prime ends blocked. The original forward strand is cleaved off and washed away, leaving the reverse strand. Read 2 begins with the introduction of the Read 2 sequencing primer. As with Read 1, the sequencing steps are repeated until the desired read length is achieved. The read 2 product is washed away. This entire process generates billions of reads, 
representing all the fragments. Sequences from pooled sample libraries are separated based on the unique indices introduced during the sample preparation. For each sample, reads with similar stretches of base calls are locally clustered. Forward and reverse reads are paired, creating contiguous sequences. These contiguous sequences are aligned back to the reference genome for variant identification. The paired end information is used to resolve ambiguous alignments. This method is very powerful and it can detect many chromosomal abnormalities such as Down syndrome, which affects chromosome 21 and can affect one in 700 births. Edwards syndrome, which is much more serious, which is a trisomy of chromosome 18 and it occurs at a frequency of one in 3,000 births. Turner syndrome, which is a loss of an X chromosome in females, which happens in 1 to 2,000 to 5,000 female births. Klinefelter syndrome, which we have discussed. These are XXY males. This is 1 in 1,000 male births. Triple X syndrome, which happens in 1 in 1,000 female births. And of course, XYY males, which also occurs at around a similar rate. So you get in about one in every thousand births, you get this non-disjunction event, which causes a chromosomal anomaly, which can lead to a divergent number of chromosomes, either in whole or in part. Cell-free DNA testing, this non-invasive fetal testing procedure, is pretty powerful that you can even detect a number of other chromosomal abnormalities, such as to George syndrome, this 1p36 deletion syndrome, and these are pretty rare events that occur. Angelman and prater willi syndromes, which are of course these great examples of genomic imprinting, which occur in about one in 20,000 live births. And the phenotype in this, as we've discussed in the past, and is also discussed in the book, is um, different depending on which parent passes the deletion that occurs in the long arm of chromosome 15 to the offspring. We have Creed-Ducat syndrome, which is quite rare, one in 50,000. And this is caused by deletion on the short arm of chromosome five. There's things such as microencephaly and hypotonia, all sorts of things that can happen in this illness. The wolf hirschhorn syndrome is also quite rare. It affects the chromosome 4 in the, in the P region. And you can notice in this one, as in the 1P36 deletion, that these are de novo effects. These chromosomal changes are not inherited in the sense that they don't run in families. These are events that happen during gamete formation that causes these chromosomal changes. So this is quite a list here, and I, I don't want to get into the details of everything. I just wanted to give you a, kind of an overview of the types of chromosomal abnormalities that can be detected with this method. Many of these are very rare. However, with this technique, you have the power now to look at these, these particular types of abnormalities and know whether your baby has any of those. And I think that's a, this is a pretty powerful tool for parents. And at the same time, you don't run into any of the risks that amniocentesis or CVS can cause. So I'm going to put these, as I have in the past, these slides up on Blackboard. So if you really wanna read about all these different illnesses and know more about them, you can look at this more carefully. But I think it, it's not gonna be all that fun for me to just read these things to you. I think you can read these for yourself. I just wanted to get give you kind of an overview. So in summary, there's a lot of ways to test the health of your fetus. You can look at chromosome abnormalities and, and test 
what the carrier type of the cells are from your baby using amniocentesis or CVS or the non-invasive, the cell-free DNA testing, which is simply done by a, a, a blood test and then sequencing. Cleft lip and palate are still assessed by ultrasound. So this is basically a visual look. So there's no DNA tests available for that, but perhaps there will be someday. Cystic fibrosis can be detected by DNA analysis. And right now it's only done through amniocentesis or CVS, but perhaps in the future, cell-free DNA testing can be used here. Dwarfism can be detected by ultrasound or X-ray. And then some forms can be detected by DNA analysis. Hemophilia can be detected by sampling the fetus's blood, which is pretty invasive, or DNA analysis that of cells by amniocentesis or CVS. Perhaps this in the future will also be able to be done through the cell-free DNA testing method. leash nehan syndrome, this is a biochemical test on cells from the fetus. This is yet to be replaced by a DNA-based test. Neural tube defects can be detected initially with a maternal blood test. Then you would probably do biochemical tests on amniotic fluid, which is obtained by amniocentesis. You can also visually inspect the fetus using ultrasound to look for neural tube defects. Osteogenesis imperfecta, which is this brittle bone syndrome, at this point, there's no genetic test for this, so you have to use ultrasound or x-ray. An x-ray sounds pretty intense. I would recommend ultrasound. But of course, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a professor. Phenoketonuria. DNA analysis is applicable here, so hopefully soon we'll be able to detect uh, this using a non-invasive method and, and with sequencing. But right now, we're still stuck with amniocentesis and CVS. Sickle cell anemia can be assessed by looking at fetal blood directly, and there are also DNA tests for this. So I imagine that we will see amniocentesis replaced here by the cell-free DNA testing. Tay-Sachs disease, this requires doing a biochemical test on cells obtained by amniocentesis or CVS. There's no DNA test here but it's possible in the future that there will be a DNA test for this. The point I'm trying to make here is that genetic testing is becoming much more sophisticated. We are now in the genomic era, and I think testing the health of your fetus is gonna become a lot easier, a lot more informative, and a lot less invasive through the use of sequencing techniques such as Illumina. When should you seek genetic counseling? So if someone has a genetic disease in your family, it might be wise to seek genetic counseling. If you've already given birth to a child with a genetic disease, a birth defect, or a chromosomal abnormality, other examples in include a couple who has a child who is intellectually disabled or has a close relative who is intellectually disabled. This may be a genetic condition. An older woman who becomes pregnant or wants to become pregnant. Many experts suggest that it should be age 35 or older. This is very controversial, so I would definitely talk to your doctor when you're making this decision if you decide to get pregnant and you're around this age. If you and your partner are very closely related, like let's say first cousins, you may want to consider genetic counseling because it's more likely that you could share some recessive disease alleles. If you have difficulties achieving a successful pregnancy, there's many miscarriages, there may be a genetic basis to this, and the counselor can help you. If you've been exposed to an environmental substance that is known to cause birth defects, it is good to get medical attention and perhaps seek genetic counseling. Also, if you have trouble interpreting the results of one of these tests, it might be useful to talk to a genetic counselor, and also I hope that just taking genetics will help you a little bit as well. Now, if both you and your partner are known carriers for recessive genetic disease, or you belong to an ethnic group that has a high frequency of a particular genetic disease, it is very wise to seek genetic counseling. 
I have friends who have, have done this. Um, it's not that difficult and they were able to learn a lot and also they had a very successful pregnancy and they now have a healthy baby. So not all of this stuff should be scary. I think in this case, as in many other cases, knowledge is power. So there's not a lot of genetic terms for this lecture, but I just wanted to give you a few. Concordant. If both members of a twin pair have the same trait. Discordant, if only one member of a twin pair has a trait. Trisomy, this is a type of polysomy in which there are three instances of a particular chromosome instead of the normal two. And this is responsible for some of the chromosomal abnormalities that lead to birth defects and health problems that can be tested for with the methods that we discussed. Well, I hope you've enjoyed today's lecture. Next time we will be talking about mapping of genes and here is the human chromosomes laid out for you. See you next time.